Nanjing, a great Chinese city of six million souls. Close to its center, there's a monument to a man many Chinese still call the good person of Nanjing. John Rabe, a German and a Nazi. He's worshipped here as a hero, a living Buddha. In the West, he's unknown. No one remembers that he saved the lives of more than 200,000 people. At the massacre of Nanking, this, one of the great war crimes of the 20th century, took place more than 70 years ago, when the Japanese took this city, looting, raping, and murdering. Raba was there to witness the atrocity. He was an ordinary middle manager at an engineering company. Today, only his diaries bear witness to what he achieved. His grandson looks after them. The testimony of a man who worshipped Hitler and did good deeds, who stubbornly pursued a simple idea and saved hundreds of thousands of lives. for Shanghai, the beginning of the Japanese invasion of China. The Japanese Empire has used a small firefight as a pretext to launch a massive incursion. The Japanese plan calls for the capture of Shanghai in three days, but Tokyo has miscalculated. The Chinese army puts up fierce resistance. Hundreds of thousands die. Shanghai doesn't fall until the 9th of November, three months later. The strategy of the quick victory has failed. 70,000 Japanese soldiers have been killed. As a result of that, there was a very heightened sense for revenge among the Japanese troops, down to the ordinary soldier who has lost uh, his comrade. And this, in some ways, was one of the causes for the behavior of the Japanese troops after the Battle of Shanghai. New orders are issued. March on Nanjing, then Nanking, China's capital, 270 kilometers to the west. But Japanese troops are exhausted, and their supply lines are almost non-existent. They advance, leaving a bloody trail of pillage and murder. Within days, the first bombs are falling on Nanking in what soon becomes a daily assault. John Raba is on vacation far away from Nanking. He hurries back to the office and his work for Siemens, the German industrial giant. He knows the city only has weeks before the Japanese arrive. He can follow their progress via Radio Shanghai, still broadcasting after the takeover. Since the attack on Shanghai, John Raba has kept a diary. The early entries make depressing reading. All the wealthy Chinese have long ago begun to flee up the Yangtze. Many Americans and Germans have gone with them. Hundreds of Western diplomats and businessmen have sent their families ahead of them to safety. They're staying only long enough to wind up their affairs. John Raba is lucky. His wife, Dora, is staying on at their vacation resort. His children and grandchildren have already left China. Raba must make a decision. But there is one moral point I cannot get past. Our Chinese servants and employees all look up to their master. These poor serving classes simply do not know what to do. Can I, have I the right to run away under these circumstances? I think not. Anyone who has ever held the hand of a Chinese child for hours on end, squatting in a dugout during an air raid, 
will know what I mean. Mein Großvater war Hanseatischer Kaufmann. My er war was a German businessman with a strong sense of duty, Umgang always mit seinem Arbeitgeber und seinen Kunden. In seinem privaten Umfeld war er dominant, aber sonst war er eigentlich ein schlichter und bescheidener Mensch. A few others will also stay in the city. Georg Rosen, a diplomat at the German embassy, and two American missionaries, Minnie Vautrin and John McGee. They all know each other from Nanking's exclusive international club. But all they really have in common at this moment is their decision to remain in the doomed city. They've turned their backs on the river Yangtze, the only sure means of escape. Nanking has always been a fortress city, protected by 35 kilometers of city wall, 15 meters high. But in the 20th century, a wall like this won't hold up the invaders. It will confine the inhabitants like rats in a trap. Behind the city is the Yangtze. There is no bridge. But Raba and his colleagues come up with a daring idea. With the remaining foreign community, they could try to create a protection zone inside the city for women, children, and the elderly. It could cover several square kilometers. They know from Shanghai that something like this is feasible. Only now is it possible to tell the story of how Raba and his colleagues put their plan to action. Historian Huang Huiying has trawled the Nanjing city archives to reconstruct the events. She has established that John Raba, the punctilious German manager, took the leading role in the plan. For now, he is isolated. He can barely contact his wife, Dora. He can only write, with some relief, to his children in Germany. Our family is now spread right across the world. His distant homeland is important to John Raba. He was born in Hamburg in 1882. His sea captain father was a strict disciplinarian and brought up his son as a perfect subject of the German Empire. But he also gave John a love for travel. His first name came from an uncle in Australia. John soon won the love of his life, Dora, the chemist's daughter, through a piece of simple heroism. Sie wohnte in der Nachbarschaft und mein Großvater lernte sie kennen. Da war die Dora auf vier Jahre alt und fiel in eine Pfütze. Und mein Großvater hat sie aus der Pfütze rausgeholt und das war der Beginn einer lebenslangen Liebesgeschichte. When John's father died at an early age, John went to work as a trainee in an import-export house. And that launched him out into the world. For several years he traveled through Africa, mostly in Mozambique. A ruthless adventurer, taking jobs and life as it came. At the age of 26, he traveled to China. And a year later, Dora joined him. They would stay in China for 30 years. He was happy to be working for such a big company. Later they sent him to Nanjing. The houses were dripping with damp, he would say, and the cracks in the floor were so big you could talk to the neighbors through them. But Raba knew how to make the best of things and slowly won promotion. Siemens built turbines, telephone exchanges, and hospital equipment. Raba became general manager of the Nanking branch. He went back to Germany only twice, but he pinned his hopes for the future on a distant authority figure, the Führer, Adolf Hitler. While sorting through his belongings, waiting for the Japanese, Raba found a poem written by one of Hitler's most loyal lieutenants, Baldur von Schirach. This is the greatest thing of all. He is not just our Führer and our nation's shield. He is himself, simple, strong, 
standing tall. While in him sleep the roots of all the world. His soul may reach to heaven, to the sky, but he is still a man like you and I. Robert took it literally. He believed every word. That gave me courage again. A simple, straightforward person like you or me wouldn't just feel sympathy for the sufferings of his own people, but also for the people of China. Raba believed and continued to believe that the Fuhrer would stand by him. In 1934, he joined the Nazi party. He wanted the parents to get money from the Reich for the school, because it was very expensive. Someone had to join the party, and he knew that the parents wanted to do that. So, as the founder of the school, he joined the party. He thought it was the right and sensible thing to do. The German school, part of the privileged post-colonial lifestyle of foreigners in Nanking. For Rama, joining the party was no sacrifice. For a while, he would even be regional party leader in Nanking. A student stayed with Raba for several weeks. Erwin Wickert would later publish extracts from Raba's diaries. He was not an intellectual. He was not an intellectual. He was a simple man. He had a very good sense of humor. In any situation, even when things became really awful, he would still see the funny side. Rabe loved to sketch, especially ravens, the translation of Rabe's name from German. And he accompanied the drawings with little ditties that helped take the pressure off when times got bad. Even in the darkest days when the bombs were falling. A dugout's not the place to hide when bombs are falling far and wide. It only takes a tiny shard of steel to hit you nice and hard. The Chinese Defense Army in Nanking mobilizes all its forces. The capital is to be defended to the last man. Those are the orders. But sandbags piled against the south gates will not stop the Japanese. Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek is China's dictator. He chose Nanking as the new capital of his nationalist government. It has supreme symbolic importance. It has the same significance for the invading Japanese. They've been extending their influence on the Asian mainland since 1931, when they burst from their Korean colony to occupy the Chinese province of Manchuria. It took them just five months to take a country half the size of Western Europe. Tokyo needs natural resources, above all, oil. Back at home, things have been going badly. Earthquakes, stock market jitters, and finally, after the Wall Street crash, Tokyo's markets collapse. The rural population are suffering most, sinking further and further into poverty. One solution, the army's solution, is further conquest. Emperor Hirohito gives the army free reign. Power goes to the people who proclaim the Japanese the Asian master race. The army must solve Japan's problems. Japan felt threatened. Without oil, the economy would go down the drain. The superiority of the West was a huge concern. Japan aspired to be one of the great powers, so it too could look down on other peoples. Hirohito himself appoints the commander for the attack on Shanghai. He brings General Iwani Matsui out of retirement. The Emperor probably also gives Matsui instructions to take Nanking. It should take four weeks for the Japanese army to reach the gates of Nanking. But with the invaders, all is not well. The troops were not well supplied. They have to uh, enter civilian homes and they have to resort to looting in order to become fed. So that added to the frustration. 
Meanwhile, Chinese soldiers who escaped from Shanghai are fleeing before the invaders. Among them is Li Gaoshan, forced to join the army at just 13. The top commanders and the older officers had already fled. Our whole unit had to pull back. Because of all the different dialects, we couldn't even understand each other. We didn't know the way. Without the others, we'd never have made it. We just followed them towards Nanking. Many Chinese soldiers get lost and fall into the hands of the Japanese. They're brutally executed. Civilians receive no mercy. In villages along the route, men, women and children are gathered together and mown down by machine guns. Meanwhile, John Raba is busy transferring his company's money out of the city. First, he pays out the salaries and wages. They will all receive their pay before the office shuts down. He will balance the books with German precision. The servants are going around with despairing expressions because they think I'm abandoning them. When I explain to them that I'm definitely staying in Nanking, they become happy again. The last foreigners in the city now set up the International Committee. Their vague intentions are becoming a firm plan. They will attempt to establish a protection zone for civilians. John Raba is elected chairman. The others believe a Nazi will have the best relations with the authorities, both the Chinese and the invaders. My protests are in vain. For the greater good, I give in. I hope I can be worthy of this post. It could become an onerous task. Any Chinese would have been killed in the city. Now, Chinese would have been killed in the city. Now, Chinese would have been killed in the city. Now, Chinese would have been killed in the city. Now, Chinese would have been killed in the city. Now, Chinese would have been killed in the city. Now, Chinese would have been killed in the city. Nationalist Chinese leader Chiang Kai shek is still determined to defend Nanking. But his generals advise him against it. Resistance is pointless, strategically worse than useless. So Chiang Kai-shek leaves the city and the mayor goes with him. One army general remains. John Raba is now the only civilian authority left in Nanking. The departing Chinese have left him just $40,000. With the government gone, hundreds of thousands of refugees quit the city by crossing the Yangtze, freezing cold in a wintry November, or taking the railroad to an uncertain future. The poor, the sick and the old stay behind with their families. They've heard a rumor of a possible protection zone. They're desperate for it to be true. Every day, the civilians pray for clouds, because on a clear day, the bombers come and fail. Rapa calls it bombing weather. Most of the victims are civilians. They called them sulfur bombs. They kept on burning after they went off. I saw two blackened corpses embracing each other in death. That was the worst thing I saw up to then. 1.3 million people live in Nanking. For most, it's now too late to leave. The cameraman taking these pictures will stay. He will continue filming long after the Japanese arrive. The American missionary, John McGee. It was dangerous, very dangerous. But he determinedly had these pictures. They were a documentation of what the Japanese were doing to show the world. The Japanese never knew my father was taking these movies. Otherwise, they would have shot him. Later, McGee will smuggle the rolls of film out of the city to be processed, sewn into the lining of his overcoat, proof of Japanese crimes. 
For now, though, Raba faces practical problems. He must feed the hundreds of thousands starting to flood into the protection zone. He must stock up on medicines against the risk of epidemics. He just gets going. He calls in all his contacts, has rice gathered from the surrounding countryside, commandeers or purchases all the available gasoline and medicines. And he lists everything, like the dutiful manager he is, so that everything can be fairly distributed. We have to get flour, salt, fuel, medicine, and pots and pans into our zone before the Japanese arrive. We can't wait until the last minute, because by then we shall be cut off from the world. Raba even opens the garden of his own house to refugees. Eventually, there are 600 people camping there. Li Shijian is one of them. We children didn't talk to him often. But he looked after us and took care of us. When he gave us sweets, the world was OK again. Everything was good again. Mu Sifu, who would become her husband, also shelters in John Raba's garden. Bamboo poles, poles for tents. If we needed something, he got it for us. We had rice and beans to eat every day. You could just talk to him without any formalities. He never kept his distance from us simple people. When I came back, I realized how much we depended on him. Raba keeps strict office opening hours for the refugees. He works patiently through all the notes and requests he receives. The bureaucrat as savior. He explains his actions to the Chinese in terms of his Nazi ideology. The Nazis are a government of the workers. They will not abandon poor people to their fate. Raba believes deeply in help from the very top, from the Führer. On the 25th of November, he writes a telegram to Hitler. Head of the Nanking Regional Party Office requests that the Führer employ his good offices with the Japanese government to engage their consent for the creation of a neutral zone for non-competence. Unless this is done, more than 200,000 lives are in danger. He really does hope that Hitler will help him with the Japanese to agree to a free peace zone. He wants to help the Japanese and our allies. But Hitler was a hero. 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 Raba has seen only the attractive side of national socialism, like the Olympic Games of 1946, ideal international propaganda for the regime. But even in Germany, most people don't acknowledge the regime's fundamental inhumanity. It's difficult to say whether 8,000 kilometers away, Raba would be aware of book burning and the persecution of the Jews. But he certainly knows that Germany and Japan have become allies. In 1936, they formed the Anti-Comintern Pact, directed against the Soviet Union. Italy soon joined them. Berlin, Tokyo and Rome went on to sign the Three Power Agreement, claiming vast spheres of influence. On the two days following Raba's telegram to Hitler, no bombs fall on Nanking. Raba is sure that the Führer has put pressure on the Japanese government. He's heard nothing from Berlin, but that doesn't worry him. An answer from Hitler cannot be expected. This kind of delicate diplomatic issue is no doubt dealt with on another level. Nothing will shape Raba's trust in the goodness of the German authorities. He believes what he reads in the German newspapers, like many expatriates. They didn't see the negative side. Or they assumed it was enemy propaganda. The German language newspapers in China were increasingly under the control of the Nazis. And of course, they gave a pretty fast picture of Germany. 
but a fellow member of the International Club has every reason to know the truth about the Nazis. German diplomat Georg Rosen has a Jewish grandmother. The foreign ministry is forcing him out of his job. But even this doesn't open Rabe's eyes. Rabe would have realized that there was no future at all for my father in Germany. That he had no career prospect. And that he might soon have no way of making a living. Der Verlust der beruflichen Existenz überhaupt drohte. In his diary, Rabe wrote, his grandmother has ruined his career. It's a tragic fate. The Japanese have broken through the last line of defense before Nanking. The bombers are now hitting home day and night. Some Japanese commanders proposed bombing Nanjing to the last person. Uh, some even contemplated the use of uh, poison gas in the attack on Nanjing. So that shows there was a disregard for international law. No one has ever found a written order confirming this disregard. No one can say for sure that leading generals or the emperor himself knew about these excesses. But most historians believe that atrocities were tolerated. There was a policy to terrorize the Chinese population. There was some kind of order issued at a relatively high level of the Japanese field army to dispose of the Chinese uh, prisoners. By the beginning of December, the people of Nanking can hear the thunder of the Chinese guns. Hundreds of Chinese soldiers are still falling back on the city. Thousands more will not make it. The gates of the city wall were closed. We had to attach ropes. Then, one after another, we climbed up over the wall. When we got up there, we saw many, many more of us waiting below. The International Committee are now meeting every day. Only the diehards have remained. Embassy personnel are being evacuated. The Americans load up their belongings and make for the gunboat USS Pane, moored in the Yangtze, waiting to take them to safety upstream. John Raba, John McGee, and a few others go on board the Pane to send a final appeal to the Japanese. No acts of war should take place inside the city. But no member of Raba's committee leaves on the Pane. John Raba and my father and people in here said, no, we can't leave. Our job is not to save our lives, it's to help save the Japanese, Chinese people from rape and murder and everything else, so they stayed. Shortly after half past one on the afternoon of 12th of December, Japanese dive bombers attacked the panel. The crew were totally unprepared. They were convinced they were sick. The bombs wrecked the bridge and the engine room, leaving the ship without power. By the time the captain calls abandoned ship, she's already sick. This is original footage of the attack. Japanese planes strafe the lifeboats. Even when the survivors reach the shore, the Japanese continue bombing. We were in England, there wasn't much communication in those days. And we heard that Americans had been ordered to go on this gunboat, as they called it. And we heard it was sunk and many American lives were lost. Oh my God. Three men die, 48 are wounded. Two and a half hours after the attack, the Panay sinks. Today, an attack like this might start a war. But America, still horrified by the slaughter of World War I, is firmly isolationist. Washington simply takes note of this provocation. President Roosevelt protests to Tokyo 
and accepts compensation of $2.2 million. If the Purple Mountain beyond the city walls burns, Nanking is lost, Rabba writes in his diary. The day after the sinking of the Pane, this old Chinese proverb comes true. Early that day, 250,000 Japanese soldiers reach Nanking. Japanese artillery destroys the city wall. Conquerors have everything to celebrate. Tokyo has sent its newsreel camera. They must immortalize this scene of consumption. General Matsui takes center stage. He has been promoted to commander in chief of China. For now, the Japanese seem relatively restrained. They tied us up and made us sit on the ground. I could never have guessed that they were about to become so brutal and inhuman. The staged newsreels are deceptive. Behind the scenes, the massacre of Nanking has already begun. Those Japanese devils set up their machine guns and aimed at our heads. It was completely cold-blooded calculation. They wanted us all to die at once. Everyone was cut down. I saw heads bursting open. The only reason I wasn't hit is because I was a head shorter than the rest. Rabba records similar scenes in his diary. As we drove around the city, we realized the scale of the destruction. Every 100 or 200 meters, we came across corpses. They showed signs of having been shot in the back. There is barely any Chinese resistance. Just before the arrival of the Japanese, the general defending the city changed his tactics and gave the order to withdraw. Too late. The result is chaos. Few of the Chinese soldiers can escape the Japanese invaders. Anyone who is caught has no chance. John McGee films in secret as Japanese troops gather together Chinese soldiers who've tried to disguise themselves as civilians. The conquerors show no mercy. Tens of thousands of soldiers try to flee to the north along the Yangtze. The Japanese force them together at Yangtzeji Mountain. There they bayonet and behead them, burn them alive and shoot them. Between 50 and 60,000 Chinese prisoners of war. This is one of many sites. This one is a memorial. The Japanese also murder fleeing civilians. A soldier stabbed my mother with his bayonet. She was carrying my brother in her arms. He was two years old. She collapsed. My brother was screaming and crying. She was holding him really tightly. She gathered all her strength to get up again. My sister and I were screaming. Mummy, mummy. He looked at the soldier, please don't stab mummy. Chang Chiu Xiang is nine years old. In the confusion, he blacks out. Moments later, he comes round again. My mother was in her death throes. She was tearing at her dress. It was a terrible effort. 
again and again oh, my mother tried to tear open her dress while she'd managed it my little brother Zhaole ran over to her I suddenly understood when she died my mother was trying to pacify me his five brothers and sisters his parents and his grandparents are all killed Xia Shuzin's family are also trapped by the Japanese. Their neighbors had fled. They had money. There were five of us children, plus my grandparents and my father. None of us had any work. How could we have survived on the run? We depended on our grandparents. Those who can't flee the city try to hide in their homes, like Xia Shuzin's family. But they're found. They killed the neighbor's two children who were visiting us. Then they dragged my mother onto the table and tore my sister from her arms. They killed the neighbor's two children My mother was still very young then. They shoved two tables together and threw her on top of them to do what they wanted with her. They threw my two-year-old sister into the courtyard and they beat her to death. Xia Shuzin and one sister are the only survivors of the family. John McGee films the bodies and the woman who finally brings the two children to the safety of the protection zone. John Raba documents the horror in his diary. He notes every crime he becomes aware of, a total of 444. Making a list in a massacre gives him something to hold on to. There are now 200,000 people in the protection zone, including many thousands of Chinese soldiers in civilian clothes. Raba protects them all in an unusual way, with swastika flags. He hopes that the Japanese, Germany's allies, will not attack the Nazi symbol. The protection zone was given to the three flags. So in the protection zone, there are 25 camps. Garbage cans are sent to the scene. They 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 are sent to the scene. Again and again, Japanese soldiers break into the safety zone. Because of the numerous intrusions by the individual Japanese soldiers into the safety zone in Nanjing to get women or to loot, um, the International Safety Zone Committee made repeated requests to the Japanese authorities to put uh, military police at various uh, entry points to keep away the Japanese soldiers. Raba stations his own guards, but they can't stop many of the crimes. His study has become the committee's headquarters. One simply cannot grasp the degree of suffering here, he writes on the fourth day of the massacre. He still believes the men in authority will act when they learn the scale of the crimes. Every day, he sends telegrams to the high command of the Japanese army, asking them to keep their soldiers in check. Ginglin College, a women's university campus. It's the main goal for the Japanese incursions in the zone. Today, it's part of the University of Nanjing. During the massacre, 10,000 women and girls sheltered here. Vodra, missionary and college principal, tries to protect them as best she can. John Raba never neglects his tour of duty. He regularly visits the wounded at Gulo Hospital. There's just one surgeon here to treat all the patients. He operates round the clock, an American, Robert Wilson. Dr. Wilson showed me some of his patients. The woman who has several bayonet wounds to the face, 
who was brought in with a miscarriage, is doing reasonably well. A sampan owner who was shot in the jaw and whose whole body has been burnt because they poured gasoline over him and lit it will probably die. The Japanese were looting, raping women, killing people. We went to Harba in the garden. Nothing like that happened there. No one was taken and raped. If Harba hadn't been there, we wouldn't be alive now. More and more people crowd into the protection zone. Raba's garden is seen as the safest place of all. Raba is everywhere, in his garden, in the whole zone, looking after the most desperate people. They need him, his encouragement and his care. Often he distributes food himself, weapons, swastika armband, steel helmet and typewriter. He's fighting the tide of history. And this loyal party member still believes he's doing his Führer's work. In his diary he notes with pride. Whenever detachments of Japanese soldiers come into my house, they disappear again as soon as I hold my swastika armband under their noses. He had a Nazi flag on the roof of his house. The Japanese didn't even dare to enter the property. Once, when a unit did come, Raba yelled, Get up! Climb back over the wall, the way you came. He didn't even let them leave by the door. Week after week, John Raba fights for the people of Nanking. They call him master. He is their servant. Their survival is his duty. This was a situation that brought out the best in him. Everyone who saw him in action in those weeks was full of admiration and deeply moved by the way he often risked his own life for others. It would be an unfamiliar sight. The swastika as a symbol of humanitarian aid. John Raba, the good Nazi of Nanking. John Raba has saved more than 200,000 people from almost certain death. After several weeks, the Japanese move on. The survivors try to pick up their lives. In thanks, they present John Raba with a silken scarf. May the grace of heaven be upon you, it says. For the rest of his life, John Raba will be venerated as a living Buddha. Massacre, John Raba returns to Germany. Siemens has ordered him home. In his luggage is his diary and a copy of McGee's film footage. Dora meets him in Shanghai. They will travel home together from there. An English gunboat board had him done in Nanking. A British gunboat picked him up in Nanking. The international press and international society celebrated him as a hero. In Germany, no one had heard of him. In Deutschland, wusste man nichts von ihm. As soon as he arrives in Berlin, Raba starts giving talks and presentations. He wants to make sure influential people in the Nazi regime are aware of the massacre of Nanking. At Siemens headquarters, he addresses a gathering of senior Nazis as a true German patriot. I would like to say at the outset that it is not my intention to spread anti-Japanese propaganda. Even though I feel the deepest sympathy for the sufferings of China, I am, in the first place, pro-German. But that does not alter my belief that it is right that our beloved Führer and leading figures of our fatherland should know the truth about the events in Nanking. A few days later, two men pay a visit to his apartment. Raba follows them without a word, his diaries under his arm. His granddaughter is playing outside. Ich merkte irgendwie, es muss etwas Peinliches sein. I noticed it must be something awkward. Natürlicherweise wäre ich meinem Großvater entgegengerannt und wir hätten uns gegenseitig umarmt und have a safe journey Schön and come back soon. But I just said, good morning, and waved to him. 
So habe ich ihm also nur guten Tag gesagt und so zugewunken. The Gestapo interrogate Raba for three days. He never talks about it, except to say that they shone a light straight into his face. John Raba never again speaks publicly about his experiences in Nanking. He is allowed to keep his diaries. Raba's faith in Adolf Hitler remains undiminished. Raba even writes him one last letter. My Führer, in sending the attached account, I have fulfilled a promise to my friends in China to let you know about the sufferings of the people of Nanking. My mission will be fulfilled if you have the goodness to let me know that this account has been laid before you. The last words of John Raba's war diary. John Raba lives on with Dora in straitened circumstances. He does occasional small jobs for Siemens. A living Buddha in China and an outcast in Germany, he says, with grim humor. 就是沒有糧食,就他皮膚病也出來了,很多病都出來了,知道以後呢,就希望拉貝到中國,他就中國政府也起訴也希望把他,而且給他提供的全家的,給全家都到中國來,但是拉貝沒願意,沒有同意,
as the Chinese official history uh, claim it to be. Um, so there are different ways of looking at it, but I would say in terms of historians, serious historians in Japan, they recognize it was a major atrocity. Today, John Raba's house in Nanjing is a memorial. He has never been recognized in the West. At first, he was even refused denazification after the war. He died in Berlin in 1950, sick, poor, and forgotten. He was one of those truly great individuals who sacrificed a great deal out of simple conviction, to do good for other people without ever getting any reward for it. Ohne das ihnen das vergolden Wort.